fabulous job hosting. Sorry, I got to adjust this. Jacinta's short. <laughs> we love her, but she's short. It's fine. It's great. How's everybody doing? Yeah, yeah everybody doing all right? Melissa, you okay? Yeah. Okay, all I see was the top of your head. You good? All right, Melissa's good. So we're all good. That is how that works. It's good to see everybody. Uh, if you're watching online, if you're in the room, and I have not met you, my name is uh, Pastor Adam, but uh, if you ask Elise, <laughs> uh, what's that? Mr. Ordained Pastor Adam the First. That's what it is. So write that down. Uh, it needs to be at the top of your notes. That will be on the quiz. So go ahead and write that down. But it's good to see everybody. It's good to be in the house. Um, I'm glad everybody's doing well. I uh, hope everybody had a good weekend. Okay, if you were like me, you had a weekend that was pretty full of um, a lot of uh, checklist type um, things that you needed to get done. You know, I, I started this weekend. I, I wrote everything down so that I wouldn't forget it. I was like, all right, I got, I got a vacuum. I got to do my laundry. I got to do the dishes. I got to, you know, go over some, some more of this message. Like I, got, I had this entire list of things. And I felt really good after having written the list. And so... <laughs> Some of you know where this is going. I have written the list. I was proud of myself. And so I did naturally what any grown man would do after making such a list. <laughs> Close. I took my phone, I turned on Spotify, and I started listening to a uh, playlist of Disney songs because I'm an adult and you can't tell me not to. So I, uh, I don't know why. I was just in the mood for that. I, I felt very... Uh, just <laughs> taxed by making the list, you know what I mean? You're like, all right, I know exactly what I need to do, but I'm not doing it now, you know? That's just kind of the, the mood I was in. And so I turned on this playlist, and I started listening to, you know, the classics, of course. Um, and, and I got to uh, this portion that was all, all songs from The Lion King, um, you know, which is really Jesus' favorite music. Um, it's in there. Look, look it up. Um, and so I was, I was going through, I was listening to all these Lion King songs, and, you know, um, you know we got down to uh, Hakuna Matata, which, which is always fun. That's one of the songs that you can't really listen to just sitting on the couch, you know. And so I did do the dishes. I will say I did accomplish that, um, but it was only because Hakuna Matata was playing. And so that's what I attribute my, um, my productivity to was Hakuna Matata, because you can't sit down listening to that. And so... I was listening to my, my Disney, you know, my, my, my jams, you know, doing everything other than what I was supposed to be doing. And um, it just got, kind of got me thinking about the Lion King movie. It's, it's one of my favorite movies, and it's got one of my favorite uh, corny moments of humor all the time. Because if you'll remember, you know, Simba, he goes and he meets Timon and he meets Pumbaa. And they're having this conversation. And during this part where the song comes up in the movie, Hakuna Matata, he's like, it's our motto. And he's like, what's a motto? And he goes, I don't know. What's a motto with you? <laughs> uh, so if you can't laugh at that, I have bad news for you. You might be dead inside. Um, that is the pinnacle of humor. That's comedy gold. So if you didn't laugh, um, I don't know what to tell you. But that's I just remember being really young, and this tells you a lot about me as an adult, but when I was really young, that happened, and I... I just lost it. I just thought that was the funniest thing. It was just really comical to me. But it kind of got me thinking about this idea of, because I knew kind of what I wanted to talk about this morning, and um, this idea of, of, of a motto kind of has been sticking with me a little bit as I've been kind of preparing for this message. And so um, I, I went and looked up, um, you know, when you're in high school and, like, you graduate and your pictures are in the yearbook, and some schools will allow you to put, like, little quotes like little life motto type things underneath your picture. My school never did that, which is probably a good thing. But some schools allow you to do that. I'm sad I missed the opportunity. But these are the three things that I found when I was looking at this that just made me laugh, right? These, these were the mottos that people chose to put under their picture in a yearbook, right? First one, people who say nothing is impossible have obviously never tried to dribble a football. That, that's fair, you know, like that's fair. I don't know if you're a sports type person, but dribbling a football, that's impossible. Okay, second one. <laughs> this, this is a life motto of, of graduating high schoolers, okay? Sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. <laughs> <laughs> that's our, our uh, public school education system. This is what they're walking out with. Sometimes you're the windshield, 
San Jose the Bug. This one is my favorite just because it's just so honest, okay? <laughs> it just said, if you always keep both feet firmly on the ground, you're always going to have trouble putting on your pants. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with life, but he's not wrong, you know? And so it made me laugh. And then obviously, Hakuna Matata, that's a motto as well. That was on there. Somebody put that in there. And, you know, this idea of a motto is just like, Th this is what I know to be true about life. Insert statement, right? And so um, this morning, I think I want to talk about that idea for a minute. I'm not necessarily going to ask you what your personal life motto is, but I think the longer I live life, the more I become aware of certain things, okay? And one of those things is that life puts us in positions where we have to respond, Right? I think we can all agree with that. You guys all right? We got some tired. I need you to talk to me. All right? We good? We good? All right. And so life puts us in these positions where we have to respond. And oftentimes, if we haven't already decided how we will respond, when those moments come, we start to flounder. Right? When we haven't made up our mind, when we don't know what we're going to say, when we don't have this idea of like, this is how I view life, this is how I respond to these problems, this is what I know I will say, we kind of had those moments where we go, oh, I can tell this is an important moment. I can feel that how I'm going to respond is, is going to be significant in some way, but I haven't thought through it yet, okay? And so this morning, I want to talk a little bit about kind of what that moment looks like in response to the faithfulness of God. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about, and I want to entitle this message very simply, I've been here before. Okay, I've been here before. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this morning, Lord. We ask that in the time that we have left, Jesus, that you will come, that your Holy Spirit will infuse these moments and make them matter, God. As we continue to look, at, to, to look into your word, Lord, we ask that you would just bring out life from it, Father, that you would use it to shape us, to form us, and to make us more like your son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So we're looking in the book of Psalms this morning, uh, Psalm 91.4, if you've got your Bibles or if you want to make a note of it. And I want to read this really quickly, okay? <clears throat> we're starting at verse 4. It says, He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. And I love this part. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart, okay? You will not feel the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you, okay? And I want to go back to that, that line I just prefaced right there, and it says, his faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart, okay? And I don't know about you guys, but I remember when I, when I first read this when I was in Bible college, I didn't know what a rampart was. Like, that was one of those words I'm like, I've heard that, but I'm not entirely sure. You know, I had to do a little bit of research, okay? And so shield, obviously, very obvious, very important. Shield, it's about protection. Blocks right here, right in front of you. Daryl's going to come at me with a sword. I'm going to say, Daryl, where'd you get that sword? But it's okay. Got my shield, right? Shield, very obvious. We know what a shield is, okay? A rampart is the name given to an elevated part of like a castle. Okay, so you guys have seen these these walkways that are kind of up at the top, you know, where where they'll have like patrollers and 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 you know people who are tasked with guarding the castle, things like that. That's what a rampart is. It refers to that elevated walkway on the top of a castle, okay? And so the reason that was significant to me, like I said, shield, that's kind of obvious, okay? But a rampart, from a defensive standpoint, I wrote in my notes like this, a rampart informed perspectives which then shape decisions, okay? And so we've got this right here. For this morning, we need to make sure that we know that his faithfulness will protect us, okay? But it will also elevate our perspective, all right? And so when we start to experience and recognize God's faithfulness, our lives begin to become shaped by the fact that we start to learn that we can trust him. Okay, God starts to establish his self in our lives, and he starts to kind of make this track record where when we get places, we can say things like, okay, I've been here before, 
and I remember what happened. You know, I've been here before. I remember how God responded. I remember how he led me. I remember how he protected me. I remember how he provided for me. I remember how he comforted me. I remember because I've been here before. Okay? So this morning, I have three truths that I want to talk about, three, three thoughts, three things that we have to really own when it comes to this idea of, of the faithfulness of God and, and this, if we want to live lives where we can say, okay, I've been here before, these are things that we have to internalize, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and preface this. This is one of those messages that it's not the most fun to hear all the time. Does that make sense? This is one of those messages that if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to have moments where we open ourselves up to development that maybe is not all that comfortable. Okay, if we're going to be molded into the likeness of the Son of God, that at its core means that where we are now cannot be where we are later. And that requires some change, that requires some, some introspection, that requires some humility to sometimes hear things that we go, I don't like that that's true. It is, but I'm not a fan of the fact that that's sometimes how life looks, okay? And when we, when we have those moments, we, we get two choices. We can either argue with what we know is true, that's the least effective option, or we can say, okay, what do I do with that now? Okay, and these are some of that, uh, some of those, some of those thoughts. So the first one, I wrote it like this, and this is one of those things where you go, eh, okay. So God's faithfulness can sometimes be overlooked when God's faithfulness is not what we're interested in or looking for. Okay, I'll say it one more time. God's faithfulness can sometimes be overlooked when God's faithfulness is not what we're interested in or what we're looking for. Can we be honest this morning? Is, is that all right? A lot of the time, we're not interested in God being faithful. Like, we're not looking for the signs of God's faithfulness. We're more looking for the signs of God's answers. Does that make sense? Like, we have these moments, we need something, we're praying for something. Our eyes are very acutely searching for where is God doing what I am asking him to do? Where are the answers? Where are the moments of the fulfillment? Like, where is my situation being changed in response to what I'm asking God to do, right? Can we be honest with that? That's kind of in our flesh, that's what we want. <laughs> that's what we're looking for. That's kind of most ideal scenario for a lot of us, okay? And so the truth is, and we don't say it like this because it feels very like, but <laughs> the truth is we would rather God be obedient than for God to be faithful. We would rather God be obedient and just do what we ask him to do Rather, for him to be faithful and say, I'm not going to do what you asked me to do. I'm going to do what's best. And those are not always the same thing. They're, they're actually very rarely the same thing. <laughs> and so we have those moments, and we start to go, I, and again, we don't say it like that. But we're like, okay, God, this is what I'm asking, and I couldn't help but notice, you're not doing this, okay? And I'm doing my part. I'm praying, so my box is checked. So now what? You know, and we start to have these moments where like, because we're not looking for the right thing, we miss the things that God is doing, okay? And so when we start talking about this, like, I don't know if you know this, but when it comes to the faithfulness of God, there is a predictability that comes with that, okay? There's a predictability when it comes to what God promised he would do, okay? And that means that we have to be people that know there are things that God did promise and there are things that he did not promise, okay? The thing he did promise was that faithfulness factor, okay? That he would be there, that he would be present, that he would be aware, he would be close, he would be actively involved. These are the things that God did promise us. The things he did not promise us the most frustrating one, clarity. 
it's not going to always make sense. And if you're somebody who needs things to make sense, I'm sorry. <laughs> because you're going to be frustrated at times, as we all are, because that, some of that is in all of us. But God did not promise that everything would make sense. He also did not promise that your request, you all right? Okay. <laughs> He didn't promise that because you asked it in a certain way, that would be the way that he accomplished it. Okay? And so what happens, and the dangerous part of this, is if we're not careful, we get a skewed view of God because we look at what he didn't promise, we don't see it, and then we make decisions about God based on things he never said he would do. Okay? And so when it comes to this idea of God's faithfulness and this idea of like resting in the fact that he's, you know, he says to us, you know, I, I, you know, I've, I've been there before. That requires us to make sure that when we view what God is doing, we view it in the light of what he said he would do, not what we've decided he should do. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. So that's the first one. God's faithfulness can be overlooked when God's faithfulness is not what we're interested in or searching for. Number two, and this, this again, it's frustrating, okay? I'm going to preface it. I get it. I understand, but it's true, okay? The second one, God can certainly do the miracle, but seems to prefer the process. God certainly can do the miracle, but seems to prefer the The process. And this is the most frustrating thing about life with the Lord. It's just, we don't like this. You know, we don't like the fact that whatever it is that we are going through, whatever it is that we would identify as a problem, we have relationship with a God who is very capable of a finger snap fix. You know, I, I think in conversations of, like, of healing and conversations of, like, you know, provision and conversations of, like, like, these are not things that exist outside the realm of God's immediate solution. And so we have to then open ourselves up to the fact that, say, okay, if God can do the miracle and if God can do, you know, the instant, if God can fix this thing quickly, and then chooses not to, there must be a reason. Okay, and I'm not going to, I'm going to preface this again by saying, I, I'm i not God, right? I think we know that. I think we can agree on that. And so I'm not going to claim that I, perf- <laughs> I'm not going to claim that I understand fully the thoughts and plans of the Lord, because that would be ridiculous. But there are patterns that we can recognize when we start studying scripture, when we start examining our personal experience, when we start examining the experience of the people around us. And, um, you know, we start to have this, like, there might be goals that we're not aware of. There might be things we don't quite understand, because the fact of the matter is, everything that happens in our lives happens to achieve, if we're, if we're Christ followers, if we're walking in, in a submitted way, then everything that we do, everything we experience, everything that we walk through, every person that we meet, is to eventually accomplish the plans that the Lord has for us. Okay? And so, that means that the specifics of what we would prefer in the most blunt way that I can say it, are not always at the top of God's priority list. Now, if I wrote the list, it would look a little different. I'm just going to be honest. But I don't get to write the list. I don't get to see the script. I don't even get to know all the goals. I'm, I don't know what we're doing, you know? <laughs> and there's this, like, this understanding that God is is more interested in in our roots than he is our leaves. Does that make sense? Like God is more interested in saying, okay, m- like my goals for you are not that you will live the most comfortable life. My goals for you are not necessarily that whatever you pray will get answered in the exact way that you ask it. My goals for you 
are deeper, they are more layered, and they require a little more depth of experience than a quick yes would always give you. Does that make sense? And so when we start looking at these things, we have to consider that the process and the miracle provide different things. Okay, again, God is capable of both. He's very capable of both. I've seen both. But I think they accomplish different things. I think um, I think the process requires things of you that maybe a miracle wouldn't. I think the process requires patience. I think the process requires a different kind of faith, a different degree of faith, a different kind of trust, a different kind of longevity that is not going to be accomplished in the context of a miracle. Does that make sense? And so I, I wrote it this way. I think when we're talking about miracle and we're talking about process, I think one illustrates God's power, his capability, his ability to glorify himself in the fact that he can do what we cannot. Okay, I think that's what's accomplished in a miracle. I think he outlines his faithfulness in a process. Okay, and I have a story about, this, and his name is Miles, and he, he said something to me that just, it, it, it rattled some of the things that I believed about God. And this was a man that um, he had, he, he came and he, he talked to some of our, um, he, he gave his testimony to our, uh, one of our leadership classes when I was in Bible college. And we had an opportunity after he was done to kind of just bounce questions off of him and, and things like that. And I don't remember what the question was, but I remember that this is what he said, okay? And so he was sharing his testimony, and he had some health concerns, and I use concerns very mildly, okay? Like he, he was one of those people, chronic issues from the time he was born, like crippling, debilitating type stuff, you know? And I remember he was telling his testimony and he was talking about, you know, the pain and and just this this crippling and, and it was words that like I could I couldn't repeat them to you if I tried. Like stuff I'd never even heard of. You know what I mean? Like that's what he had going on. And um to jump to the end, he ended up having a moment where God healed him. And yeah. And and that's an incredible story. And I think if that was the end of the story, it would still be incredible, but it wasn't because he 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 began to um, you know have moments where he would talk to um, classes and, and and youth groups and things like that to kind of give his testimony because he was kind of connected in some of the um, you know local area in that way, and so he would get these sort of invitations, and he said something in that Q and A portion. And like I said, I don't remember exactly what the question was that was posed to him. But he, he, he I remember he thoughtfully kind of took a step back before he answered. And you could see he was trying to kind of process through some of his experience to give the answer in the best way. And he said something about kind of that relationship that I've been talking about here. And he was talking about kind of his, his memory of this process. And he talked about like the moment he was healed and, and just how elated he felt. And, and he, was, he was up and he was rejoicing and he was running and dancing, like doing all these things that you would expect somebody who has just been relieved from a lifetime of pain. And he was talking about as years had, had gone from that point of that, that, that initial healing. And he's like, you know, I've been you know, moving from it and, 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 and years, years removed from it, when I look back, I'm surprised by what I remember the most. Because you would think it would be the moment when he was healed. Because that's what I thought when I was just trying to predict the answer. And he said, it wasn't the moment that I was healed that stuck with, we, with me most. It was instead the moments where I was sustained.
And I remember the look on his face when he said that. And that's one of those truths that, like, we all go, hmm, like, because that's good, right? Like, that's, that's a significant statement from somebody that's lived a life that was wired in that way. And we hope we're never in, in the position where we get to, you know, like, have to walk through some of those same things. But he, he said something that just, it just blew my mind. Like, I made the same face a lot of you did. He, like, he, he said, it wasn't when I was healed that had the biggest impact. It was when I was sustained. It wasn't the miracle. It was the process. It wasn't the flashy part. It was the part that nobody saw the fullness of. Because it's easier for the memory of something like that, not that that goes away, obviously, but the memory of the moments where God was just sitting next to, this is the way he phrased it, sitting next to you on the bathroom floor because you were in so much pain you could not stand up and you sat there for five and a half hours because you couldn't move and you cried for like five and a half hours begging God for the miracle you knew he was capable of. And in that moment, it, it still hadn't come. Like, this, this was years before the healing that he eventually got. And so he's just, just this crushed, <laughs> you know, moment of defeat and brokenness and saying, God, like, I know you can fix this and you're just not. And I don't understand it. And I'm angry about it. And it hurts. And I'm frustrated. And I want to give up. And nobody gets it. I'm in this boat by myself. I'm sitting on the bathroom floor. And he told that story in a way that illuminated something for me. And what it illuminated was that idea of I've been here before because whereas God was not accomplishing exactly what he was asking, he was providing for him a track record where he could say, I've been here before. I've been here before. I know how it felt. I've been here before. I know what it looked like. I've been here before, and I know how it ended. And then the big one, I've been here before, and I know who was with me. I've been here before, and even though I felt alone, I was not. And I imagine what would have happened if, if Miles got exactly what he asked when he asked for it. Would he still be healed? Yes. Would there still be that moment of God glorifying himself? Yes. Would it still be an awesome and amazing testimony for people to look at? Yes. But what would he have lost If in that process, God gave him what he asked for when he asked for it, what would he have forfeited? And more importantly, do we believe that knowing the trade he was asking God to make, would he have still asked the same question? Knowing that he would have been forfeited this ability to say, I've been here before. I know what it looks like. I know what it feels like. I know how it feels to be alone. I know how it feels to be broken. I know how it feels to be depressed. I know how it feels to have no hope, no future, nothing in front of you, but this reiterating version of life that you are so sick of, that you are so done with, that is marked by pain and suffering and isolation and loneliness and despair. Like, I know how that feels. But I also know the closeness to which God clings to us when we know how that feels.
Chris, you can go ahead and come back up. I'm going to close here. This was not originally in <laughs> the, the rough draft version of this message. Um, I, had a, I had a different third point. Because um, we, we've been talking a little bit this morning of like, I've, I've been here before. I've been here before. That's the theme, okay? I've been here before. And it struck me as I was praying This idea that, like, in my relationship with God, I'm not the only one that's been here before, too. Jesus has also been here before. And here can take whatever form you need for it to take. Whatever experience you are walking through, whatever life is hitting you between the eyes with, so to speak, that is not a foreign concept to the God that we serve. That's not something that he can't relate with. Hebrews says it like this. It says, for we do not have a high priest that is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. And I'm thinking through the life of, that, that Jesus had and, and there are moments where Jesus has been here before too. You know, there are moments where Jesus has been lonely, where Jesus has been disappointed, where he's been frustrated, where he's been rejected, where he's been weary, where he's been at the end of what he feels like he's capable of even to the point where he said, hey, if we can do this any other way, that's what I want to sign up for. Now we know the cup ultimately did not pass from him. But he asked. He asked because he was so in that boat that we've all been in before. He was weary and he didn't ultimately like the plan. And so this morning, let's just take a moment and remind ourselves that whatever we're experiencing and whatever emotional response that it elicits from us is not foreign to Jesus. And because it's not foreign to him, we can trust him in dealing with it. Because he knows how it feels to be lonely and disappointed and rejected and weary and isolated and misunderstood and fill in the blank. <laughs> because he knows how those things feel, we can trust him to lead us through them. Because we don't have a high priest that is unable to empathize with our weakness. So I want to pray for just a minute. And when I do that, I want to challenge you to really kind of open yourselves up to, to some of what has kind of been coming on this morning because I mentioned it earlier, th these are not fun things that are true. But they're still true. And so this morning, we have a choice about how we respond to what is true. And so Jesus... As we close this morning, Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the truths that are contained within it. 
And we thank you that you loved us enough that you wanted us to have access to these things so that we could live a life that was abundant. And so, Lord, as we begin to close out and as we process some of these truths about your faithfulness and as we process some of the things that maybe we would write differently if we had the pen. Lord, I ask that you would just give us wisdom. Lord, that you would give us insight and that you would give us courage to look at these truths in the face and allow your spirit to do the work inside of us that is required to internalize them. And so, Lord, this morning, we yield, we submit, we say do what is necessary so that we can have the life that is a testament to your faithfulness. Where people will look at us and when they see what we're going through and when they see what we're up against and they see everything that is on our plate and when they look at that and they know that they would respond totally differently and they look at us and they say, how are you doing that? we can smile and we can look at them and we can say, because I've been here before. And so, Father, that's our prayer this morning. God, that we would rest in your faithfulness. God, that we would be shaped by it, that our perspective would change because of it. Holy Spirit, come, seal these truths, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Pastor Adam, thank you for that message. We hope you all have a great week. We love y'all. Y'all are dismissed. <laughs>